Okay, so my name is Peter O'Rourke. I'm the Executive direct, Director of the NAPSIG Foundation. Uh, this is a continuation in our series of um, virtual training sessions for public safety officials around the country. Uh, today we have the pleasure of having Chris Vaughn from FEMA and Chris Barnard from uh, DHS presenting on the subject of remote sensing and incident support. Uh, thank you very much to the attendees for participating. I know many of you are facing some se severe weather uh, issues right now, so those of you who are able to participate, thank you. Um, and also particularly thank you to Chris and Chris for their um, time they put into this excellent presentation, and we'll have a wonderful training session today. Uh, so with that said, uh, I'm presuming everybody can see uh, Chris Vaughn's home uh, homepage here and we'll turn it over to Chris and Chris. Um, if you guys could just give a little bit of background about yourself and then we can jump right into the presentation. Thank you, uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, this is Chris Barnard, uh, this is Chris Barnard, and I did have one housekeeping request, Peter, to ask. Uh, the way we have got this configured on our end, we've got the slides in full screen mode so we can't see the question box. So if you would be good enough, uh, as questions come in, if you could just interrupt us and pose them to the whole group, Chris and I will respond as uh, as you ask them. And we uh, do, uh, you know, it, it's great. I'm thrilled that we've got such a large audience today and crossing a whole variety of different weather uh, weather situations. I hope uh, you folks in the in the Midwest and in New England are going to be okay. Um, my my name is Chris Barnard. I am the Remote Sensing Advisor for the Department of Homeland Security. I am a certified photogrammetrist by training and profession and spent the vast majority of my career in the private sector working in the surveying and mapping industry. My job is to address and look after uh, policy and strategy as it relates to adopting remote sensing across the Department of Homeland Security. And one of the major areas where imagery gets called in uh, is supporting a variety of different kinds of incidents, both emergency and non-emergency. And with me is my colleague and friend Chris Vaughn, and I'll let Chris introduce himself. Thanks, Chris. Hello, folks. Um, Chris Vaughn. I'm the Geospatial Information Officer for FEMA, brand new position uh, at FEMA. Um, formerly, I was the Remote Sensing Coordinator for FEMA. Um, so I got to deal with Mr. Barnard on a whole slew of issues. Um, really been at FEMA for about three years, and before that I was an analyst, uh, imagery analyst actually, with um, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and a lot of the work that I did there uh, really revolved around the Homeland Security mission, so supporting DHS in a multitude of um, environments. <coughs> um, I guess just a quick comment, we, we are coming on the heels of probably one of the best um, use cases of geospatial, and we actually lump at FEMA, we're trying to lump imagery and GIS uh, together. Um, it's something we're, you know, we're, we're following the footsteps of, of uh, General Clapper. You know, we're, we're, we're trying to put everything together in the term geospatial because it's more than just imagery, it's more than GIS, it's a blending of the two. Um, but bottom line, we're coming on the foothills of, of uh, or the, um, the, the the end state of Hurricane Sandy, Superstore Sandy, whatever you want to call it, where we saw an explosion of, of imagery that we used. We actually used a lot of imagery, and we'll get into that in a little bit, but um, one of the largest missions from Civil Air Patrol, which is basically a low-tech, low-cost solution, um, and blended that with some very high-resolution, professional-grade imagery from NOAA, and I'm sure we'll get into all that and the use cases of how we're using imagery and the exploitation of it to answer programmatic questions. So let me uh, let me just fill you in a little bit on what we were proposing to do today. Uh, we were going to start off with a quick remote sensing 101. Uh, I'm assuming a lot of you all don't really know the nuts and bolts of working with imagery in the computer environment, so we were going to talk a little bit about that, familiarize you with some of the terminology and some of the concepts. Uh, we were going to give you an idea of the remote sensing landscape. Chris has already sort of mentioned this from a FEMA perspective. We'll talk about it from a department-wide perspective. And then in the end, we'll provide you all with some resources. Uh, Peter has a copy of this uh, slide deck, and it will have several websites that are listed in the back part of the presentation. And it will allow you to go up onto the Internet to look for imagery and other kinds of data uh, during 
a whole variety of different types of incidents. So I think we've covered this, so let me go on to the next slide here. Um, imagery is an extremely widely used uh, data set. I'm sure you all know now looking at Google Earth or Google Maps or Bing, uh, imagery is just a key part of any map display that you see now. Uh, the value of remote sensing for supporting specific incidents has a whole variety of benefits, and I just thought I'd run through them quickly with you. One, it provides you an overview of what the affected area looks like. It gives you a current snapshot of what, what are the actual conditions on the ground. It's very good at recording very fine details about condition over a given site. Uh, it provides, thanks to a variety of pieces of software and uh, processes, it gives you the ability to make accurate measurements. You can, you can estimate volumes, you can estimate distances, you can estimate heights. It gives you an opportunity in an office environment to make assessments of the conditions on the ground. Uh, because much of this, though, it, as you'll see, it's kind of simplistic to say it's just collected from airplanes or satellites. Uh, the fact that it can be collected from an, a satellite or an airplane allows you to get access to an area which may be blocked because of deep water or debris or other conditions. So it can get you information about conditions oftentimes when somebody in a car or somebody on the site would have trouble getting around. Again, it provides a detailed record, so it's something that can be kept in the long term so that people will come back years later to ask what were the conditions of a given site at a given time. This will provide an accurate record of those conditions. Thanks to advances in just geographic information systems software, imagery now can be easily combined with other data layers in the GIS environment. So this is something where you can look at the photograph, overlaying it with other data sets, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And also, I'd say it's comparatively easy to share. Data, imagery data tends to be very large. Uh, and again, that's an issue that we are all still addressing here, and we'll get into that a bit more as we, as we go forth, but it is getting progressively easier and easier now to move and share images uh, in the computer environment. So um, the term remote sensing, I actually got in, into the business in the late 1970s, and at the time, remote sensing was really sort of restricted to what you could capture from an imaging satellite or what you could capture from an aerial camera. But remote sensing is now a much more growing and dynamic area. It's got a whole variety of different kinds of systems. Uh, in terms of high-end systems, it includes imagery from satellites, imagery from aircraft, elevation data, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, video, thermal, and many other kinds. You can also combine this with stationary cameras, with people's cell phone cameras, with other types of sensor systems, uh, temperature systems, weather system, weather sensors. All of these things can be brought together and all collectively are called remote sensing. So it is a much, much, it is a growing body of information and it grows every single day. Um, and one of the important concepts about remote sensing when, when you think about it, uh, when you take a picture, you are taking a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional world. Therefore, a photograph in and of itself does not accurately represent the world that you see. If you try to measure on just, if you, if you take a picture of a building the, and try to make measurements of it, those measurements will not be accurate because a, a two-dimensional representation has a whole variety of different types of distortion that you have to take into account and you have to measure and compensate for. If you think about it, a map is a representation of the Earth from directly overhead. A picture isn't that way. Uh, a picture, there is only one spot in a photograph where it's truly, the view is either truly overhead or truly facing the object that you are photographing. Everything else displays, displaces radially from that center point. Therefore, you have something called radial distortion. The 
camera itself does not take into account the fact that buildings stick up out of the ground or that there are hills and valleys, so you have, uh, you have terrain distortion. And then the camera itself will not necessarily be absolutely parallel to the Earth when you take, uh, when you take the picture. So you also have those distortions to take into account. So if you're going to process a photograph so that it can be displayed and viewed accurately, you have to have several things. You have to have some known points on the ground. Typically, these are acquired from ground surveys. You have to have an accurate location of the camera, and that's the, not only the location, but also the orientation of the camera at the instant of the exposure. Uh, you have to know the attitude and orientation of the, the camera, and you also have to understand the changes in terrain. So photographs, uh, you can, you can capture this information in a variety of different ways. And I'm not going to go too much into this, but what I will say to you is that most of modern camera systems collect much of this information uh, as, the, as the images are being photographed. So you simply feed that data stream to a piece of software, and it can actually calculate those distortions. It can apply them to the photograph, so then the photograph will display in correct geographic orientation and scale to another data set that you have uh, in there, be it, uh, be it line graphics, be it point features, uh, the, the image will display correctly. So this is a concept for vertical photography. It's a concept called orthophotography. The, the term ortho comes from the Greek, uh, it comes from the Greek which is uh, either right or true. So what we have here is a photograph of a portion of downtown DC. And I'm showing you that photograph laid over a network of the roadways. And as you can see, the photograph and the line, the line networks actually line up. So as you pan and zoom and move about the photograph, the, the data sets that you display over that photograph are gonna be in the correct location. Now, I had said to you earlier that when you collect this data and make a map, you are actually creating the data looking truly vertically. An ortho photograph is, an, is, is corrected so that all of the ground features are in their correct location. However, those things above the ground, buildings in this case, are going to rate, they're going to retain their radial distortion. So you may end up seeing the sides of buildings, and depending on where you look in the photograph, it may be more displaced than in others. So the actual buildings themselves are not in their correct location, just the roads and the sidewalks and the other ground features. This also applies in this particular case to a, to a type of photography called oblique. Oblique, you intentionally photograph the Earth from an angle. This is very useful for incident response in the fact that you can see the sides of the building. So as you can see here from uh, after a flood or a hurricane, it's very useful to determine what, how deep is the water up next to the building, is the, are the sides of the building damaged, and it could conceivably be that the roof is still in place but the walls themselves are displaced. So oblique data is quite useful in that respect. But the image that I'm showing you on the left, uh, again, talks about the ability that you can correct this data. If you understand the relation of the ground, you can actually ask the computer in this case to project the line work so that it displays correctly over the oblique image. So again, it's the, it's the power of the computer system to be able to deal with multiple data sets and display them together. In this particular case, we're looking at property boundaries and the center lines of roads. Now, this is a concept. I have thrown this in. These are actually images taken from our um, mission for Customs and Border Protection. But the images on the right, uh, again, talk about another one of the uh, important values that remote sensing brings you that we have two different photographs of the same area taken at different times. And this is something called temporal analysis, and it is, the, it is a tremendously powerful tool if you are looking at a 
an area where you want to look at change over time, or if you are in a, if you are after a serious incident and you want to watch efforts recovering uh, and repairing damage, you can take repeated photographs of that same area, and you can then quickly measure and understand over time how a situation is changing. So if we look at some other remote sensing platforms, uh, things that you would typically be able to acquire for an incident would be imagery from the commercial imaging satellites. This is a, a high-resolution satellite image of the presidential inauguration in 2008. You can see some of the, some of the folks there on the mall and see how, what they look like. Uh, this is a good example of radial distortion. If you look on the right-hand side of the image at the U.S. Capitol, you can see that the satellite was off, is looking at it off to an angle. So you can actually see how the dome is offset from, uh, from the center. Uh, typically, satellite data covers a larger area, and typically it is at lower resolutions. So the highest resolution that you can generally hope for is about two feet an object two feet in size in the ground or larger. So really the value of satellite imagery is if you have a big area that's been affected and you want to sort of understand what the impacts were. Satellite data is typically available after a large scale incident. There are several ways of getting it. FEMA uh, will place requests and will, you will start to see uh, a variety of satellite images uh, being obtained after a large scale incident. Those will be available on some of the information portals that I'm going to show you at the end of this uh, at the end of this discussion. Um, one of the uh, one of the one of the main line products from remote sensing is pictures taken from aircraft. This can either be aircraft or helicopters. Uh, what I'm showing you here is an ortho photo. Uh, it's vertical, so the camera is looking straight down. And this is showing you uh, imagery taken before and after the horrible uh, tornado that hit Joplin, Missouri a couple of years ago. And this just shows you the ability to, again, to compare data sets to make an assessment of how, of how the area has been impacted. Uh, and again, you can also see because the image has been corrected and is in, and is in, in an ortho photo, the before and after will register together exactly and overlay one another. Modern, oh, I'm sorry, modern cameras uh, typically will acquire different portions of the spectrum of visible light, and this will allow the computer to combine these in different forms. Uh, depending on what you are looking for, by combining the bands differently, you can see different objects. Uh, these are two of the most common renditions. On the left is false color infrared compared to the same area on the right in natural color. The false color infrared has simply boosted sensitivity of the camera up. It eliminates blue light and captures um, near infrared in its place. So you would, though the image is still displayed and you still see the color blue, the color blue is actually not representing the blue wavelengths. This can be very valuable when you're looking at things like standing water or stress on vegetation. There are a variety of uh, different things that can be derived from a false color infrared rendition if you hand this to somebody who is familiar with the data. You can actually collect more than four bands. You can collect multiple bands. And this becomes something called multispectral. Uh, multispectral is valuable when you are trying to highlight things that may not uh, be visible by, by either a combination of just false color infrared or natural color. What we're showing you in the lower right, or in the lower two images, is a fire scar. And if you look on the left-hand side, you'll see in a version in natural color, you really can't see where the fire, uh, where the fire occurred. If we look at a multispectral rendition on the right-hand side, on the lower right, granted you get some oddities because of the way you've combined this. You've got the water appearing bright red, and you have this, the clouds appearing in bright blue, but you can clearly see the difference between the areas that are burned and the areas that are not burned. 
So this is, again, a tremendously, this is the ability of remote sensing to answer questions that may have a specialized, uh, require specialized tools. From multispectral, which is many bands, you can go to something called hyperspectral, which is hundreds of bands. And this takes, uh, typically these camera systems take very, very small areas, but they display and collect the data in hundreds of different sections of the visible wavelength. What you can do then is by combining these together, though you may get some very odd colors, you can look for very specific phenomenon. Uh, this is an example using it to look for standing petroleum in water. Uh, it can be used to look for a whole variety of things. The multispectral and hyperspectral are very specialized sensors. Typically, these are not used in a normal incident, but I have seen many times where you have chemical spills or oil spills. Uh, some of these can be quite severe, and this kind of data can be invaluable. It is important on, for people like Chris and myself, if you are dealing with incident managers, they may come to you and say, I have a situation, and it is for the professionals to be saying, well, I think given what you're looking for, this might be a valuable tool. Again, these typically hyperspectral, if you think about something on the order of Hurricane Sandy or Hurricane Katrina, this kind of data would be done for very specific areas within that overall damage area. You would be looking for certain effects that would have occurred, uh, either chemical, chemical releases or chemical plumes, something that uh, you would want to get a specialized, specialized look at. We also have a growing body of uh, data sets now being collected where you are collecting video, or in this particular case, you are collecting radar. And this is a product taken from uh, the Department of Homeland Security's uh, Predator drones, which are used by Customs and Border Protection to monitor the uh, northern and southern borders. However, they have been tasked in incidents in the past to acquire video for damaged areas. Uh, in the lower section, you are seeing on the left-hand side a radar image of a substation area, which you're seeing in the middle. Uh, one of the advantages of, of radar is that it is not affected by clouds, so that this is something that can be flown even when conditions are, are impossible to collect regular photographs. We also have systems that collect, uh, that collect elevation data. This is getting a bit, this is probably not something that you as a first responder would be interested in, but just to, because it is remote sensing 101, we'll tell you about it. Uh, we have the ability to collect elevation data very accurately now from either space-borne or airborne systems. LIDAR is a, an acronym for light detection and ranging. This is an active system. It has a laser that pulses at hundreds of thousands of times a second. That, those laser pulses are distributed by an oscillating mirror beneath the aircraft, and the laser fires, it starts a clock, and it records when the pulse originated, and then it stops the clock when that pulse, the reflection of that pulse is received back at the, uh, at the uh, sensor. What you can build up then is an extremely detailed set of points describing the terrain surface. This is, a, um, this is an interesting system uh, where camera systems are passive. They simply record what the light is reflected off of an object. The LiDAR system is an active system. It actually has its own laser, so it's actually illuminating the area. So this can work in day or night. It actually carries its own light source with it. We can then move to either a, not, a completely different way of doing the same thing, and that's rather than using light, we use radio waves. This is called radar. And again, we have the ability on aircraft or from space to acquire synthetic radar that will allow you to look at the amount of t the time difference that it took the radio wave to return from the transmitter to the aircraft or to the satellite and we can then use that to, as a function to measure terrain. And what I'm showing you here is that you can collect this at a whole variety of different resolutions. So on the lower left, you can see a very coarse representation of elevation. Moving up, 
you get finer and finer and finer. So as you uh, look at the same area, you are seeing progressively finer areas of detail. Uh, typically with remote sensing, the more detail you see, the smaller an area you collect. So where you have satellites collecting very broad areas, as you get into aircraft, the more detailed you get, the smaller and smaller of an area you, you collect. So again, it's important to understand what it is you really need to see and how much area do you need to see, which has a real dri is a real driver for what, um, what kind of system you want to field. So more things that you'll need, as if uh, all that wasn't enough. Uh, what one of the most important things that you need to d be able to describe, so you have an incident and you're working with your FEMA representative at a joint field office or a regional office or a state EOC, you need to be able to describe to somebody what is the area that you need. So that's very important. It can be individual points. It can be a single big connected area. It can be a variety of small disconnected areas. It really depends on the incident. But you need to be able to describe that. Um, how much detail on the ground do you need to be able to see? What are you trying to look for? Are you looking for big things like standing water? Or are you looking for things like what features are displaced? Are buses overturned or cars overturned? It's going to have a bearing on uh, how much of what kind of remote sensing you would acquire. How accurately do you need to uh, see this on the ground? Do you need to make res do, do, if you get within a yard, is that close enough? Or do you need to be within six inches? That's very important too. Uh, one of the things that Chris and I have been, have been trying to address over time is how quickly does the data set be, how quickly do you need to have the data? Uh, typically in an incident, the data has to be acquired very fast. Incident data has a very short shelf life. Uh, so in order for it to be valuable to a first responder or to a, a, an emergency operations manager, the data needs to be no more than a day or two old. Beyond that, it's probably faster to go out and acquire the data on the ground. So how quickly does it need to be done? If, it, if you can wait for a few days, Remote sensing is a very good way of doing it. If it needs to be done right away, it will have a bearing on how value, you know, whether you should use remote sensing or not. Um, do you want to just see the picture, or are you trying to get an answer, like uh, is, this, uh, is this area of storage tanks flooded, or did this facility get flooded? Is this facility open? Uh, you may want to see the picture, or you may want someone to actually uh, take, that, take that picture, combine it with other data sets, and give you an answer back. And then also, do you need to uh, share the image? Do you need to share that image with other people? It's, if you're going to do that, what's the best way of doing it? Do you want to give it to people on a DVD? Or do you want to put it up on a computer server and set this up so that you can set it up as a web service? Do you want to email it? it that has a great deal. It has a bearing on uh, how, you'll, how you'll approach the data, depending on what you're going to be doing with it. Are there any questions so far? Yes, there are actually wonderful uh, timing. There is a question. Um, uh, first question is, what sort of software is, is utilized to input photos over LIDAR or other points? Uh, Apro, Mike, Mac, question, question. The drones mentioned in your bullet point remind me to ask if this is in the GIS world yet. I've been researching it in the archaeology world. Um, let me we'll ad address the drone part first. Uh, again, since remote sensing is a growing and dynamic environment, uh, the use of drones is something that people are looking at very seriously. There are a lot of issues associated with, uh, with using drones, particularly for incidents in the U.S. Um, you, the Federal Aviation Administration puts a lot of restrictions on what you can do with a drone, so in a lot of cases, it, uh, it really isn't applicable for incidents, but I tell you, everybody is uh, looking at ways of using them. You have lots of them that have been used abroad. Uh, certainly in, the, uh, in, in the, the war theaters, they're used constantly. So um, it is something, the data from them can be processed and used in a GIS system, but are they the most efficient way to, to acquire the data? That, it kind of depends. Um, the other question was, what is, uh, what is the software to process LIDAR data and imagery together? 
there are a variety of different pieces of software that works. Uh, ESRI software, which is, uh, I think, probably one of the industry standards, is, I think, the most common one. Uh, once, the, once the data sets are, have been processed, it's comparatively easy to not only display them, but to manipulate them together in the computer environment. Uh, there are some other data sets. I mean, if you were just wanting to display them, something as simple as uh, Google Earth could be used. But if you're going to do analysis, you probably need something with the level of processing of uh, ESRI. Is there anything else you want to add on that? It's, it's, from my perspective, this Chris Bond, it's, it's very heavy data, I guess. You know, it, takes, it takes a lot of memory and RAM to do something with it. They're big data sets. Uh, and in that respect, you're processing lots and lots of data, so you need a fairly robust computer to uh, to be able to manipulate them. Does that answer the question? Uh, we can have feedback um, if it doesn't, but in, from my standpoint, it does. Um, and just a point of reference, that question came from the New Jersey uh, Department of Emergency Management. So um, good to know they're covering archaeology as well as good public safety Thank issues. Thank you um, for the question. Yeah, one comment as well, um, imagery uh, from the above, just really to highlight something you already said, Chris, but uh, imagery from above um, uh, certainly is necessary from a public safety standpoint because it is difficult to access ground area, and Superstorm Sandy was a great example of that. And um, again, yeah, and Peter, this is very true, and I had said it earlier, but I think it's probably a good idea to restate it now is the fact that you are dealing with, I really haven't gone into a lot of the terrestrial kinds of photography that can be supplemented with this information. So you can have people with smartphones, uh, as long as there is a, as long as the picture has a reference to the global positioning system, GPS, uh, you should be able to bring the picture in to the computer system and manipulate it. It may not be able to be overlaid directly onto the ground but you could display its point of collection, and you could then click on that point, and the image itself could display. So again, this is a whole other set of data that is invaluable when you are dealing with a law enforcement incident and you are trying to look at details of a building or an, or an area, or in an incident where you're trying to see, are the houses damaged, how badly damaged are they, how much debris is in the road, is there standing water, are there any number of questions that a terrestrial photograph can answer that an overhead picture may not give you uh, as accurate of a rendition. Okay, great. Um, Chris, I do have a follow-up from the first question. Um, also, just one comment. Uh, Chris Vaughn, uh, some folks are having a little difficulty hearing you, so when you speak, if you could get closer to the, the set. Um, Follow-up from the first question is uh, basically the question was referring to standard camera data, um, basic camera data, and where you make 2D into 3D. Mainly, um, this would be in reference to uh, critical infrastructure. Uh, yes, uh, but it works equally well for natural resource issues. Uh, again, they use it to look at crop health. They look at it to you at, for water regimes. Uh, they look at it for snow melt. They look at it for uh, the retreating of glaciers. There's, the actual remote sensing can be applied to almost any field. So uh, from an incident perspective, uh, yes, it is critical infrastructure. It's looking at uh, what damage was done to homes and businesses and the transportation infrastructure. Uh, but remote sensing is very broad, and you know we could we could probably sit and, and list things that it could be used to support uh, all day long. Okay, and then I'll I'll do one more question. You guys are um, getting us a lot of questions here, so that's great. Oh, good, that's excellent. Do one more question so you can keep moving, then we can get back to some other uh, questions. Um, is there a driving SOP for FEMA and or DHS similar to the Wildland um, G Stop? Um, and, and I would add to that the NAPSIG um, standard operating guidance document for emergency operation centers. Um, is, is there a driving SOP for FEMA and DHS on this? Well, this is Chris Vaughn. I can take that. Uh, internally to FEMA, we do have doctrine that we're working on, 
But, uh, mo well, all of our doctrine really leverages the Homeland Security Geospatial Concept of Operations, which is actually um, available on the NAPSIG website. So that, that basically outlines the, um, the, the going in conclusions on what we should be doing during any given event and how we should be approaching response, recovery, mitigation, and preparedness. Does FEMA share any of their SOPs down with the local responders? Is that is is there a uh, coordination mechanism that allows these folks to uh, to get this information from their FEMA regional office? There is. Um, um, we we are uh, doing our best to reach out where and when we can. Um, FEMA does have uh, ten regions, and inside of each one of our regions, there are regional geospatial coordinators which are very attuned to the way that we conduct business. And um, we actually, in the room, I've got um, a really good contact here. Um, Tom Springsteen from the Homeland Infrastructure Foundation Level Data Working Group, Highfield, um, is here. There's also a component of Highfield called Highfield to the Regions. And that's really a coordinating element between um, NGA, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, DHS, of which FEMA is a part of, USGS and DOD. All that to say that we have that in the regions working with our FEMA regional coordinators to try to get the information uh, and remote sensing data needed during any given event. Thanks, guys. Um, I would just add to that that NAPSIG is working on follow ups to the SOG we did for um, multi agency coordination centers. Um, we're focusing one on wildland fire from the EOC perspective and one on coastal oil spills, and, and we are working with federal agencies as a part of that in addition to our normal constituency of state, county, local government um, officials. So I think the more we coordinate together, which obviously, Chris, to your point, is the concept of geocon ops, um, we, you know, the, the more coordinated, the better, and, and we'll continue to do what we can. Um, and the interest time, guys, could we um, jump to the to the presentation again? The questions are great, but I want to make sure we get uh, as many of these uh, bullets out, information out as possible. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to change gears a little bit and give you a sort of perspective from the department and look at the way the department views remote sensing and how some of the issues and challenges that we are trying to uh, address. Again, uh, I think this will just give you an idea of where we're coming from. One of the things that the department tries to do is to collect data to support state and local partners. And I think one of the things that's important and you know, we would like to try to learn from the follow-up surveys is how well do we understand those requirements. But let me just give you a, a bit of a perspective from the department. Uh, when it was formed, uh, the department actually comprises 22 separate uh, missions. Some of these missions have their own uh, airborne collection capabilities. Uh, Coast Guard has helicopters with cameras in them. Uh, CVP has drones with uh, cameras and video in them. Uh, again, we, uh, these, these folks, we all try to cooperate and work together. Uh, in the event of a large emergency, FEMA under the uh, Robert T. Stafford Act uh, is, has the authority as the lead agency and can task either the missions within the department or other agencies to perform tasks to support those who are affected. Um, though we have our own aircraft, though we have our own systems, overall the department are more consumers than we are producers. Uh, a lot of the folks here are managers. They are business people, and what they are using the data for is to make decisions. They're not analyzing the pictures. They're simply using the information to make decisions. So, again, I would say that, you know, the vast majority of folks within the department, we are regular consumers of this data rather than people who produce it. Um, so uh, the last bullet uh, I think is one of the uh, – I, I think it's one of the the major issues, and we're grappling with it. We'll talk a little bit about this uh, through the rest of the of the of the uh, presentation. But the idea that the obstacles that we're we're running up against now are not so much to do with technology as they are to do with the maturing of the geospatial community, our abilities to 
understand our own information needs and our abilities to effectively share information that we produce with others. So it's as much of a strategy and policy question now as it is a technology question. So some of the issues that uh, the department is trying to deal with at the moment, uh, the first one, social media and crowdsourcing. How do you effectively deal with this? It is a tremendous, it has tremendous potential for use during incidents of all different sizes. But it, rep it represents a huge data set that comes in from all over the place. How do you know what, that the data is authoritative? How do you know that it's accurate? How do you make decisions based on it? It's a huge issue. Uh, FEMA is already uh, effectively utilizing social media. Uh, and again, it's something that we are continuing to look at policies and strategies for how, do you, uh, how can you use it better. Uh, the other one is how do you provide this information to folks out in the field? So somebody who has a smartphone or a tablet or some other device, a laptop, how can we get the information to them and then if they develop information specifically, details about a part, a part of an incident, how can they get that back to somebody at a, an EOC or at a national coordinating center to help make decisions? Um, effective sharing of, of mission information and dealing with public and restricted data are kind of hand in hand. Uh, I don't know how many of you know, but the Department of Homeless Security is the largest law enforcement agency in the federal government. Uh, we have tens of thousands of law enforcement officers. So a lot of the information that's collected here is, has a level of sensitivity assigned to it. So a lot of the data that we have isn't, we are not allowed to share that with the public. But by the same token, we have a great deal of data that can be shared by the public. And during an incident, it's very important to very quickly be able to recognize which of those data sets can be shared and which should be shared and how can we make the data available quickly and efficiently. Then, uh, then another part of this, the next two bullets uh, are also linked hand in hand, which is making it easy to search for external information and how do you filter out noise during an incident. Uh, what you are finding now as incidents occur, you are thing more and more data is produced. And what that creates is a huge level of background noise that it's important, uh, one, that you can effectively look for data, that you can use the computer to search for and discover information but also how do you exclude all of the information that's out there that probably won't help you to make a decision? That's a, that's a huge issue and it will only continue to become more of an issue. Uh, that being said, looking at that problem set, I think Chris had started talking about some of the successes that FEMA had realized during Superstorm Sandy. And I was gonna let Chris just talk for a second about what happens when you do take leadership and some of the some of the successes that can be realized? Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, you know, I'm trying to wrap my head around it. I guess the the thing that I would say is, you know, we've we've always had a lot of imagery either right at our fingertips or ready to um, show or use or try to leverage during emergency uh, response event. But we were really struggling with the impacts. What, what do you do with all the imagery that you have? So for the past couple of events, really it's been an iterative process, we've really been focusing on FEMA's major program areas. So FEMA is really broken up into several major program areas such as response, recovery, mitigation, logistics, uh, preparedness. Um, in fact, we, we are following something called Presidential Policy Directive 8 which really talks about the whole community. How do you uh, provide information and services out to affect change at the local level or especially at the area where the impact is, has occurred? So to do that, um, we have found that leveraging publicly available information or publicly available imagery really has a lot of impact. You, you can share it very broadly, you can share it very freely. 
Um, for Superstorm Sandy specifically, we leveraged um, probably the largest deployment of Civil Air Patrol. Um, they flew um, over 150,000 geotagged photos. Once again, very low-tech solution, but we were able to display that information. We're going to talk a little bit about viewers and getting the information out. Um, but um, sharing the information very broadly, um, 150,000 photos, so what? Now you've just got a whole bunch of photos that you got to deal with. But what we really did was we took those images and we did what's called exploitation on top of that. And we were looking for very specific programmatic answers to questions that leadership had. What kind of damage has occurred at the structural level? And so we were able to go through leveraging Civil Air Patrol geotag photos, as well as that NOAA imagery that I was talking about, which is a very high resolution, very professional grade imagery type that Chris eloquently described earlier in his presentation. But we were able to actually go through and articulate the structural classification of damage um, across a very broad area. And we applied a very specific methodology and protocol against it, meaning if I was looking at a house in Delaware, that same methodology was applied all the way up the entire East Coast, and theoretically that same methodology would apply to homes in Connecticut. So it was, if, if you think about it, we had very much a consistency in our approach, and we were able to provide leadership with, with what I would consider very good, accurate results of impacts to Superstorm Sandy. And, and like I said earlier, it, it was very well received. We think we had very accurate results, and we're continuing to refine how and, and how fast we can conduct these assessments to answer leadership questions. And I think the, uh, and I think the other thing that one of the complexities that FEMA is dealing with and dealing with more and more effectively is the number of interactions where information has to be shared. If you look at going from first responder through deployed personnel, through FEMA regional offices, through uh, you know, state EOCs up to national level coordination, this is a huge amount of, of this is a huge number of folks that have to be that have to be satisfied and kept track of. And FEMA has done a very good job of sort of understanding the scope of that and trying to make this as efficient as possible. And one of the things that uh, that Chris made happen during Sandy was that the coordination for remote sensing collection was handled uh, down at the local level. So first responders' input could be incorporated into it. If you're trying to uh, if you're trying to do an extremely la large area, you will often not be able to at to adequately solicit information from those folks on the ground. So I think that's an important. Uh, I think that's a, a, an important advance that uh, that you saw during Sandy. I think the other thing, again, the the idea of, of speed means that you understand what you're going to do before the storm starts. And in order to acquire data quickly, you have to know where it's going to be the highest probability that things are going to be damaged. And there are a lot of different types of predictive models out there. And being able to effectively use a predictive model to say, we think this area is going to be more impacted by this area. Uh, again, modeling can, uh, it can work on very large areas. It can also be brought down and you can work on very small areas. So again, if you are confronted with a situation or you want to do something for training or planning, the use of predictive models can go a very long way in sort of directing how, uh, how those operations are going to go. And again, the other idea of leveraging data from interagency partners. Chris mentioned the GeoConOps. I'm not going to dwell on this. I think you probably all understand the GeoConOps. Uh, the way I would ask you to think about it, uh, the GeoConOps has created a community. And it is an ability to understand what your partners are producing, but it is also an opportunity for individual institutions within the community to understand what their information needs are. If you know what data sets will satisfy your business requirements beforehand, when those data sets will be available, and what, uh, what your responsibilities are to the community, uh, it will go a very long way in improving coordination overall. So the GeoConOps is really an effort to try to 
set up a blueprint that will get all members of the community making commitments to one another so that, one, you understand what it is that you need so that you can cut through the noise more effectively, but also that those who are depending on you will know when and where that information, when it will be available and where it will be posted. So you won't, it will cut through a lot of the confusion, it will cut through a lot of the uncertainty that uh, can often occur during a major incident. The CONOPS was used, a lot of the, the sort of four basic messages of the CONOPS, it is a source to identify authoritative data, it identifies points of coordination, it identifies significant technologies. Uh, these, this idea was tested, uh, it was done during one of the national level exercises, the CONOPS was looked at, people's commitments to one another, how well people were willing to uh, abide by commitments they had made. So this is an ongoing effort, um, and again, I don't think we'll dwell on it much more, but again, I would urge you to think about it from an individual mission perspective, thinking about one, understanding that this is a tremendously uh, broad and diverse discipline, remote sensing is, and to use it effectively, you really have to understand what you need to see in, a different, in different kinds of incidents. Some of the things specifically to the CONOPS that we are looking at, um, developing SOPs, again, that will tell you when data sets will be produced and where they'll be available, uh, to help uh, different, different communities to understand what different types of remote sensing data are most applicable to different incident types, and then as the community develops best practices around remote sensing, the GeoConops is an excellent opportunity and forum for sharing that information. Uh, this is just a result of the GeoConops looking at this uh, matrix. It's quite complex, but if you look at a variety of different missions across the department, we can document what folks need in terms of what types of remote sensing data do they need, when do they need it, what environmental conditions do they need, uh, how do they best want to share it. So again, uh, the GeoConops is just a good way and the associated NAPSIG SOGs and I think other SOPs that are being produced, um, it's an excellent way of codifying all of this and organizing it and making it all available for people. So I think, again, coming back to the department's perspective on this, uh, the approaches that we are looking at, uh, we, are, we look to licensed commercial sources for licensed data. Uh, during an incident, we look at commercial satellite data so we can get a synoptic coverage. Uh, that is provided through our Department of Defense partners, and that data can be made available. It is quite often shareable with first responders during an incident. Uh, often other satellite systems will be tasked through a, an organization called the International Charter. Uh, an incident rises to a certain level, they will activate this and satellite providers will make data available on a very rapid turnaround. Uh, we'll talk more about where you can find that data later on. But as a first responder, I don't know how valuable this would be. Uh, we, use, we utilize data provided by commercial content providers, uh, Microsoft, Google, ESRI. They are producing and acquiring data all the time. We use that to the maximum extent we can. Uh, we have the ability to uh, contract for specialized services. If we have specific remote sensing that needs to be acquired, we can do so. Uh, coordinating with state and county representatives, often local data is the best, it's the most current, it's the most detailed, so in a lot of cases it's good to reach out to state and local partners during an incident to try to get data from them to understand what the local environment looks like at the maximum level of detail that you can get, and also to deal with other federal partners. Um, FEMA as the lead federal agency has the ability to task other agencies under a uh, concept called an emergency support function. There are 15 of them and they cover the full spectrum of incident management. So under different emergency support functions, uh, FEMA can task other federal agencies to provide data uh, for environmental, for transportation, for health, for mass care, for food, uh, 
you, the entire spectrum is covered under this. So again, we can involve as many other federal partners as necessary, depending on what is the scope and complexity of the incident. Uh, our Office of Science and Technology is uh, providing support as well. This is quickly a project that they are working on looking, which is of some interest to first responders. This is a system that can be incorporated into an aircraft that will allow uh, the images from the airplane to be downlinked directly to a ground station located at the incident site so that you can actually tell the aircraft where you want it to go and get the images back in near real time. One of the other things that I thought as we sort of wind this down, uh, our Office of Science and Technology has just recently funded a study looking at uh, remote sensing needs at the county level. And they sent out a survey, which uh, they got 475 counties responding, which represents 15%, 14.7% of the counties in the U.S. But it's sufficiently diverse that uh, it allows you to get a, a reasonably good idea of uh, what folks are thinking out there. And this just shows you a map looking at the frequency of emergencies. And you can see that if it were me, I would like to live in Utah. <laughs> So, but if you look along the coastal areas and some others, uh, there are people that are experiencing emergency incidents all the time. The, uh, some of the interesting findings from this, uh, if you look here and the question that was asked was, what do you consider the highest priority piece of information that you need after an incident? Well, imagery actually tops the list which I thought was quite interesting. Uh, of all the things that you, uh, you could get, you know, people feel that imagery is one of the most important. This one we've already talked about, but again, looking at survey responses, this data, information during response to an incident, the shelf life on it is incredibly short. It is, a very, it is really only of value in the first three days. After that, really you can uh, get the same information from somebody else, some other means. Uh, this is an interesting one because it shows you kind of a, a wide diversity of responses. This is how likely are you to use airborne collection to, to assist in the response and recovery process. And you can look here at, they've given you a variety of different ways of thinking about this. Uh, if it's available at no cost, in other words, the federal government would fund it, you get 46% of counties saying they would use it. With shared cost, if the county has to pay for it, it drops to 4.8%. Uh, however, counties that have no expectation of whether it's paid for or not, uh, it goes back up to 48.7%. So I think what you see is um, people have widely varying opinions at the local level about how, how reliably is, are we going to be able to get this information. So I think, that's, uh, I think that's really what this is, if you read between the lines, that's what this is telling you, that you know, uh, people don't want to spend a fortune on this information, but by the same token, if it's there, they can certainly find it valuable. And again, this question is uh, how do you acquire data for, to support an incident? So this is looking at a whole variety of different kinds of things, but if you look uh, at the, second, the third column from the right, which is boots on the ground, 80% of people are relying on that as the, the method for collecting information. You look at some of these others, they vary widely, uh, but if you look at uh, helicopter or plane flyover, which is two columns to the left, again, 45% of people are looking at that, and a sizable proportion, 26, are looking at satellite or airborne collection. So I think people are familiar with the data, but again, uh, if you're thinking about something to if you really want to do something reliably, people still want to go out and take a look at it themselves. So with that, um, now that you all understand remote sensing and uh, know exactly how to use it, what we're going to give you here to finish up is just some websites that you can go to. And uh, Peter, I know you have the uh, copies of the slide deck that you can give to these people so you don't have to scribble down these, uh, the URLs. But in, during major events, data does get published to several primary sources, and you should be aware of those sources. 
Uh, if you're interested in getting information, uh, these are the places to go. Uh, the, data, the data sets will, are going to be available there in a form that's fairly easy to find and fairly easy to acquire. The first is the Hazards Data Distribution System. This is operated by USGS. Um, these folks have done a great deal of work to take huge amounts of information and to make it available fairly quickly. This is an example from Sandy where on the website you go up, you enter the incident that you're looking at. It will then, you can search for it by do I want satellite data, do I want aircraft data, and then it will quickly give you a list of what's available and I have uh, clicked on one of, those, one of those data sets and it shows you the thumbnail of the picture and you can just download it right from there. It's a tremendously valuable site. Chris? Yes. We do have one question if you can go back to the um, uh, HDDS slide. Um, when will resources be applied to HDDS to more quickly consume raw data into their viewer? You know, it's a good <laughs> question. Uh, we, are deal we are confronting times of you're going to be seeing money becoming harder and harder to come by. USGS has made a lot of investments in that system here over the past couple of years. But um, I can't really tell you how much they're going to be able to support further enhancements in the future. I know that they will be there and that the data will be available, but how much they're going to be able to extend what the capabilities of that system are, I really can't tell you. Okay, thank you for that. We've got a couple other questions, but I'll hold off until you get done with them. Um... Right. We'll uh, just quickly go through some other sources. Uh, here we have uh, the department's enterprise platform. Uh, again, this w is a site where data is available. Um, again, we are. this one is not going to be used primarily for large-scale incidents, but for smaller incidents and places where you want to see a sort of uniform national coverage uh, the DHS Geospatial Information Infrastructure is a very good place to go to. It is a restricted site. You will need to have an account on the Homeland Security Information Network to gain access to this, HSIN. Uh, if you are curious about this and want to uh, get access, please let Peter know and we will get you instructions how to obtain a, an account with HSIN to access the GII. Uh, Chris, would you like to talk about FEMA's uh, FEMA's portal for sharing of information. I had put this in there. It's an important place where data is available. Sure. Thanks, Chris. Um, very recently, um, FEMA has been working on a uh, public-facing viewer. Um, right now, it's, we're, we're calling it FEMA's geo platform, and the thought there is that we would be a partner or uh, eventually integrated into the national geo platform. Um, the other URL or link that's not here is geoplatform.gov, G-E-O platform.gov. Uh, but FEMA's uh, geo platform, you know, we've, we've done a lot of work in, in trying to put different vignettes of Hurricane Sandy. I'm, and I'm almost missing the true number of how many mini maps, I guess, is how you would quantify it. But we had everything that we could throw at um, Hurricane Sandy, and we mapped a lot of information. What you're seeing right now is a county impact analysis of Sandy as it's coming uh, on shore. And so Chris very briefly mentioned the use of predictive models. FEMA's got a group called the Modeling Task Force that is the primary authors of, of this particular vignette. But going back to the concept of predictive models, the concept really is trust the science, trust the models, understand that uh, you know those very highly scientific and academic uh, capabilities can tell you where the greatest impact is going to be, and uh, that's really how we're positioning ourselves moving forward to cut down on the guessing work of where to fly the planes next. And so, uh, uh, purple. I know that's a very odd color, but purple is how we uh, how we indicate very high probability where it's bad. Where it's bad. <laughs> purple is bad in this case, and blue is worse. And then, finally. Uh, again, uh, this is the National States Geographic Information Council, and uh, they maintain a portal called the GIS Inventory, and this 
not only has links to uh, NAPSIG, we work very closely, but it looks, you can get a variety of other data sets from here. Again, this is a tremendously valuable place to go for additional information, and the GIS inventory is searchable. You can look at states and counties that post metadata about data sets that they produce, and again, another uh, tremendously good resource to uh, be looking for data both before and after an incident. And I think that's it. Uh, I was worried we were going to take, we weren't going to be able to fill an hour, and I've yacked way past that. But Peter, I gather you had a couple of other questions. And while I do that, I'm going to just uh, take control of the presentation to show the folks some uh, ways to get some of these resources. But okay. One question uh, is, does DHSN or FEMA partner with local governments, um, in particular counties but others, uh, on the collection of non-event remote sensing data? I would say no. Uh, I mean, FEMA, FEMA applies disaster funds once there has been a declaration of the Robert T. Stafford Act. Yes. Uh, there may be some other sources for grants but um, I am by no means an expert on Homeland Security grants. Okay, well, we can, we can get some more information, Thomas, and get back to you on that. Um, yeah, I, do you, uh, Chris and Chris, do you see my, uh, my desktop now? Yes, actually we do. Great, so for those of you who are asking for where some of these resources are, um, what I will post uh, in this latest blog section here, if you can see that being highlighted, uh, is the presentation from today, so you'll have access to that in the, at a real quick click. Um, this is the NAPSIG Foundation website. Um, and then uh, things like the GeoConOps and the NAPSIG SOGs can be accessed right under the Tools and Resources category. And you can see our 3.0 version of the SOG and the GeoConOps and the fold-out poster all here, as well as a quick start guide for the NAPSIG SOG. Um, so these resources are available, and we keep them updated as much as possible. Um, so hopefully that helps address some of the um, so some of the questions about GeoConOps that might not have been addressed today. And, we will, uh, and again, uh, please look for the latest blog for the presentation from today. And we will make a, uh, I'll make a point of following up. Uh, again, uh, the department does have grant dollars available, and I know those grant dollars have been applied to geospatial data development in the past. However, uh, after, after an incident, without an, an activation under the Robert T. Stafford Act, uh, I don't, I would not look for the department to support, uh, to support state and local requirements. It would have to be big enough that uh, FEMA would have to be activated under the Stafford Act in order to start actually uh, uh, supporting and, and funding efforts for remote sensing. Okay, we have a couple other quick questions here. Um, what sort of software is utilized? I don't know if you can see this on, on the home page here, but it's it's on my page. But what sort of software is utilized to input photo over LIDAR or other points, um, APRO, MIC, MAC, or something else? Um, I think that was a question we already had. We had Patricia. talked about that. We did. Maybe it just popped up again for some reason. Um, we had a request that someone, uh, that you please reference the Los, um, Lawrence Livermore National Labs HOPS program for online access to HSIP. Um, and other services. I don't know if you guys can speak to that. We did get a, um, a presentation on that from Debbie Dennison at one point, but uh, if, that's, if folks... uh, that, you know that's an excellent point. And I, I, I was unaware of that resource, but uh, certainly if they've got if they've got it and got it in a form that uh, it can be used. Uh, again, the the idea the idea here is that you want to get a service that persists and you can always get to and one that gives you reasonably good com performance in your computer environment. So if this is a, a, a resource to turn to, uh, by all means, uh, recommend people to investigate it. Okay, and we can, I can coordinate with Debbie um, and get that posted on the NAPSIG website as well, if that's appropriate. Um, and, and all the other questions, and, and really were frankly comments, um, Chris and Chris commenting about how fantastic this presentation was and how useful the information was. So we, we really are grateful to the both of you for taking the time to put this information together and sharing it with us. Well, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to, to share some time with you and talk about this. This is, this is something that Chris and I both are, feel very passionately about. and. 
it is a fascinating area to uh, be involved. I consider myself very lucky, and uh, again, I just thank thank you all for the time, and I'm glad we could uh, sh we could share with you. Great, 